Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, attending this virtual event. Today I'm going to talk to you about SAS event stream processing at the edge and its ability to reduce or eliminate the need to transmit data to the data center for analysis. I'm Bob Augustine. I've been working at HP since 1990, yeah, 1988, um, and I've spent the last 12 years on uh, working with SAS as my primary or only partner. Um, just wanted to tell you a little bit about our alliance with SAS. HP and SAS have been alliance partners since uh, 1986. We're both uh, in each other's partner programs. And in addition, my partner and I also have 30 years of experience with SAS. I've been working with SAS since 2008. In fact, my first SAS Global Forum was in 2008 in Washington, D.C. And my partner, Mark Barnum, who's not on the phone with me today, has been working on SAS for 18 years. So we have... Uh, uh, combined 30 years of experience. HP and SAS have a, uh, a good relationship with uh, SAS's R&D uh, uh, people. We um, meet, have bi-weekly meetings where we discuss issues, customer problems, things like that. Why this is important to you is we understand, uh, so familiarity breeds um, ease of, or, or we understand our customer pain points. We're able to take our products and SaaS products and design things that will work for our customers right out of the starting gate. And some of these things are a little bit difficult to configure and make uh, and make work in a robust manner. Our customers can spend a great deal of time trying to determine how to put these things together, or we can uh, test with SaaS software and HPE equipment, and we can share with our customers how to put those things together, greatly reducing the amount of time between the time the equipment arrived on site and value. Let me give you a, a short example. A customer, when we do a test with SAS, we spend about four weeks, four to six weeks, determining how best to configure the equipment. If a customer were to do that, they would have to do exactly the same thing. But we're able to take the information we garner from doing this testing with SAS software and provide that to customers so that they're able to go live probably six or more weeks uh, earlier than they would if they'd had to do those own types of, uh, their own type of testing. So I wanted to show this slide to you as uh, HPE and SAS's uh, edge-to-core scenario. Now, we're going to concentrate on the left-hand side, the IoT edge side. But the reason to pro uh, provide this slide to you is to show you that SAS has products and, and uh, products and solutions for every stage of the data center or the edge. And also, HPE has equipment that goes along with SAS so we can peak uh, things and, and lower your spend because we don't have to kind of push things into places where they don't really belong. So we have peak, peak systems right at the edge. We have peak systems in the data center, and we can um, uh, we can bring that to bear for a customer's site. Now let's talk about some of the reasons not to transmit data to the data center in the cloud uh, to the data center latency. Let me give you an example, autonomous driving. If I'm driving down the road and my car is driving, if I have a person in front of me start to brake, so I've got to transmit that information up the data center, have it uh, analyzed, and then sit back down to release pressure on the accelerator and place pressure on the brake. If I'm doing that, if I'm transmitting it, all of a sudden I'm in the back end of that uh, the person in front of me's car. So latency can make the data uh, less impactful or worst case, especially with autonomous driving, can make it worthless. There'd be no way to do this if we were not able to analyze the data at the at, right at the edge. Bandwidth. Some of the data that we pull from the edge uh, uh, would take quite a bit of bandwidth. We, uh, our customers today are, there's quite a number of them that are doing research on autonomous driving, and they go out for a seven hour day, or an eight hour day, excuse me, There'll be a person in the passenger seat recording things on a clipboard. There'll be a driver that's got his hands near the steering wheel but not actually driving. And there's a computer in the trunk that's collecting data, all the parameters, things like cameras on the bumpers or in the, on the roofs of the cars, things like that. That collects uh, upwards of 7 terabytes of data per day. Um, in order to transmit that data, even in a 10 gigabit network, which is today an average or typical network, would take upwards of two hours per car and would consume the entire bandwidth of that 10 gigabit network. HPE makes equipment that can have the disk packs, disk, disk packs removed from the server and placed into the data center so we can transmit that data or transfer that data to the data center much more, uh, much quicker and much more cost effectively. Cost, 
uh, the larger the pipe, the more it costs. And it's not a linear progression. Going from a 10 gigabit network to a 100 gigabit network is not uh, you know, twice or even 10 times as expensive. It's quite a bit more expensive. Compliance. There are some industries, take healthcare, for instance, where it's against the law to transmit data outside or away from the edge. Um, HIPAA, for instance, uh, disallows things like that. Security. Whenever data is transmitted, it can be hacked. Um, du- duplication. And this one's quite obvious, but if we have ter- seven terabytes of data at the edge and we have to transmit or move that to the data center, we also have seven terabytes of data at the data center. That requires storage in the data center as well as at the edge, and it also requires CPUs to process that data at the data center. And reliability. No matter how good data transmission protocols get, sometimes they introduce errors into the data. Um, and, and so um, we would like not to transmit data to the data center unless we absolutely have to. Now let's take a look at some of the edge use cases. Uh, theft and crime prevention. Things like shoplifting. or uh, And we've all seen this on the news. Uh, thieves placing uh, facades on front of ATMs to catch people's PIN numbers and their card swipes. Um, we can see that with a camera, and if we see that happening, we can do something about that. Customer insight. This is a particularly interesting um, scenario, for, for at least for me. So if we have a, a series of cameras, and, and we do on, uh, at, at already in retailers to, for theft and crime uh, prevention, and a customer goes down a shelf, we can see through, through those cameras what the customer happens to be wearing. So if they're in a apparel store, for instance, we can see, oh, well, they like, uh, I don't know, uh, this type of shoe. And we can say, oh, well, we can read their faces and determine if they're happy with what they're seeing. We can deter- we can make suggestions with what they might want to purchase um, and, and so on and so forth and uh, hopefully enhance their customer shopping experience. Manufacturing. This is a, uh, this is a particularly interesting one also. We have a customer now that manufactures disk drives. They have cameras on the manufacturing line that look at the disk drives, and they determine if there are pits or problems with the disk drives before they go further in the manufacturing process. So if I have a particular platter that's having a problem, I can eject it from the manufacturing process before it gets blended into an entire disk drive, and we find out that it's faulty at the end of manufacturing after spending everything. Smart City. Today, we can do gunshot location. We can tell you the caliber of gun that's being used in the gunshot. We can tell you the direction. So we can get police officers and uh, out to sites of gunshot gunshot, gunshot activity uh, very quickly, rather than having to wait for, for uh, people to phone in 911. And traffic, think about this, traffic movement and traffic light in, in activity. I live in a rather large urban area, and sometimes the, the interstates get rather clogged going in and out of the city. If I'm able to read those with sensors in the road, and maybe there's an accident on the interstate, I'm able to deviate traffic off the interstate to the secondary surface street, and then I'm able to activate traffic lights so that the traffic on those surface streets moves much more uh, quickly. And that helps public transportation and, and tourism. So let's look at, uh, let's look at the, the data flow, um, the logical data flow. This use case came from SAS Global Forum last year. SAS provided customers with the ability to remote control a ball rolling around on a floor. There was a camera uh, focused on the floor, and it tracked the ball as it moved around on the floor. Um, the feed came to uh, from the video camera to the computer at 30 frames per second. We are able to, during those, those 30 frames, or once every 30th of a second, each time we had to identify the ball, identify where it was, compare where it was with where it was during the last frame, and then generate vector speed acceleration and all that kind of information on the fly. Here's the software and versioning that we were using uh, during our testing. Oh, yes. We use SAS Event Stream Processing 6.1 via 3.3, and then we use NVIDIA 4.10.104 and CUDA version 10.0. Okay, I want to take a moment to talk about the equipment that we use. Uh, we have a server chassis called an EL4000. This takes one to four computer cartridges. Each computer cartridge is functioning entirely independently. They cannot be blended, but they can talk to each other. Uh, the type of computer cartridges that we are able to insert into the uh, EL4000 are M510s. Those come in two flavors, 8-core 2 gigahertz or 16-core 1.7 gigahertz. 
We also have an M710X that comes in a four-core flavor with 3.2 gigahertz clock speed. And finally, we're able to put the NVIDIA T4 GPU into the server for use with our, uh, uh, for use. Here are some of the characteristics of the T4 GPU. Notice the massive number of cores that are available uh, to the to, to processing. What SAS does is they disaggregate the uh, data feed. In this case, they would disaggregate it into 2,560 separate streams, and each one of those streams get fed in parallel to the T4 GPU. Now, uh, think of each one of those cores like you would a CPU on a system. The most cores we have today, of which I'm aware, is about 32 cores per processor, but we have this GPU, which ha actually has 2,560 processors. Okay, let's take a quick look at the SAS data flow. We, we read the data in uh, from the video file that SAS provided us for this test. We push that data to WSCORE. WSCORE IDs the ball on the floor. So we push that to tracking. This IDs where the ball is currently. We filter the data and we push it to output tracks where it's compared. Uh, the present location is uh, compared to the location where it was during the previous uh, screen capture. Then we push that to speed direction, which calculates the direction the ball is traveling and its speed over the past 130, uh, 130th of a second. The thing that we're interested in here, or the thing that I was interested in when we did this testing, is we want to understand what difference fewer cores with a higher clock speed might make to the throughput versus more close cores at a lower clock speed. And I'll provide you with a little spoiler alert ahead of time. There wasn't a whole lot, if any, different. We want to know the total frames we can we can uh, process on a system-wide basis, because that's going to tell us kind of how many we can process, how many how many streams we can process. And then we want to know how many frames we can, we can process uh, in, in a per-process basis. And we want to know that because that speed fed the data to us at 30 frames per second. So we kind of look, use that as a floor. Now, you might need, in your particular instance, you might need 90 frames per second, or you might only need 20 frames per second. And that's, that's the metric with which we want to uh, track. And then what impact does having a GPU in the system have to the overall performance of that system? What difference does the GPU make? Okay, let's look at some of the performance results. Um, as you can see here, uh, we start out with one stream, and we go to nine streams. This is on the two-core or eight-core, two-gigahertz system. Um, when we start out with one stream, we're at 90, uh, 90 events or 90 frames per second across the entire system, and that goes up to 200 frames per second uh, with nine streams. On the next slide, you can see what this does on a per-process basis. We're starting again at 90, as you would expect. We get to two streams. We're down at about 75 frames per second. Three streams were at uh, about 55 frames per second, and we don't dip below 30 frames per second until we get to nine streams. So uh, even with nine streams, if you're able to uh, handle 20 frames per second, we're able to do that with nine streams. You could have nine separate video feeds coming to each cartridge in this system. Um, here's uh, the same set of slides or the same results in the 16-core uh, system. And again, we start at about 90 frames per second system-wide with one stream. We go up to about 200 frames per second system-wide with two streams. I want you also to notice, I didn't call this out in the previous couple of slides, but I also want you to notice what the system is doing in the orange uh, uh, bars uh, in the number of frames per second that, that are processed without the GPU. Here is a slide that has the 16-core the system, uh, the number of frames per second per process. And again, you're going to see just about the same uh, results with the 16-core system as with the 8-core uh, system. The one thing to note is that the orange frames or the orange bars are a little bit lower with the 8-core system than they were with the 16-core system. Now, let's do a performance comparison. This is the same data that I showed you before, but we put it all on one slide. Uh, the 8-core uh, with uh, the 8-core the system with 2 gigahertz. So. Um, the gray line at the top is the time to complete the entire test without a system, without a GPU. So just the system's CPU uh, processing data, the data. And the uh, kind of teal line at the bottom is the time to finish or complete. As you can see, it starts out with one stream at about 60 seconds, believe it or not, to process all the frames in the, in the, in the, with the GPU in the, 
uh, that SAS provided. With the CPU, we're over 400 seconds. And that went up uh, with nine streams to 200 seconds with the GPU and over 1,000 seconds without the GPU. Here is the, the, the same graph, the same graphic, when you get to uh, the 16-core system. And while we didn't get over 1,000, we came up with about 950, 970 seconds. Um, so that, that's a little bit uh, higher impact. But we did, uh, on the bottom with the GPU, we stayed at roughly the same throughput or the same time to complete those tests. Now we're able with, with uh, NVIDIA GPUs to keep track of what the GPUs are doing. NVIDIA, um, these GPUs are not actively cooled. So NVIDIA needs to make sure that we don't, uh, we don't overheat. We don't melt the silicon. Um, and as you can see, as we start to ramp these things up, the, the temperature, the peak temperature went from about 70, 70 degrees Celsius up to about 85 degrees Celsius. What happens with NVIDIA GPUs is as the temperature goes up, they start to self, uh, they start to lower the clock speed to keep the temperature from getting too, too hard and or too high having us melt the GPU. You can see that also the peak watts that were used, and, and that's, uh, and as we get to the nine streams, you can see the dip in the, in the peak watts used, um, and that's a feature of having to self-regulate the, the GPU to keep it from going well over temp. That's with the two gigahertz, uh, the eight core two gigahertz result, and here is the same information with the 16 core 1.7 gigahertz. You can see the same type of thing happening, except the knee of the curve, the amount of watts consumed went down much further um, when, when uh, we had to self-regulate at the top end of the, 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 uh, the test. Here is where to get more information uh, about, the, uh, about HPE and SAS and what we've done with reference architectures, how we've configured things, how, uh, what the throughput analyses look like. Um, at this time, I'd like to thank you for your time and I appreciate you coming in uh, or coming and viewing this video. I would like to call out on this particular slide the email addresses for myself and my, uh, one of my partners, uh, Sri Raghavan. Um, you are welcome to contact us if you have questions, comments, or concerns re regarding this video. Thank you very much, and have a great day.